Hello everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am answering some of your questions. I put up a call for questions about a week ago, and thank you so much to everyone who submitted one. I got questions both from YouTube and from Instagram, thanks to their new Ask Me a Question function. Some of the ones on there were so good, I thought I would include them in this video. So without further ado, I'm just gonna dive right in. So the first question is from Dibs Stewart, and Dibs Stewart wants to know about querying agents in the US if you are based in the UK, kind of what you're supposed to do there. The answer to this one's really, really easy. Even if you're in the UK, you can totally query US-based agents. You don't have to limit your querying just to UK agents. So both UK and US agents submit both to the US and the UK markets. So especially if you do want to have your book published in the US, you might as well query US-based agents. The next question is from Mackenzie Louise, and it is about titles. So Brightly Burning was not my original title for the book. It was something else, and Mackenzie wanted to know about about what was the official process for changing my title. So I knew as soon as HMH wanted to buy the book that they wanted to change the title, and I'm not afraid to tell you the original title. It was Solitary Star. So first of all, it was really nice. They told me why they wanted to change it. It's nice when they tell you why. They felt it was a little too literary, and the books really like big and commercials. They wanted a, a fun commercial title. So the way the process worked for me, I brainstormed with my agent a list of potential titles, and my agent and I came up with, oh gosh, we threw spaghetti at the wall. We had this like Google Doc where we were just throwing out words, buzzwords, keywords, lines from the book. We were spitballing. We had 40 or 50 options. Most of them weren't good, and we narrowed it down together to five that we wanted to submit to my publisher. So then we sent it over to my editor, and we kind of then gave it to them to make a decision. So my editor took our five options. She might have even only taken a few of her favorites to the sales, marketing, and publicity teams, and they talked about it in a meeting. And then they actually decided they took one of our submissions. Um, it was actually brightly burning stars that we submitted, and they shortened it down to brightly burning. So that is how I ended up with my title. It's always going to be collaborative between the author and the agent and the publisher, but ultimately it is decided by your publisher in the room, so to speak. The next question is from Alexander Spies, and he asks about beta reading, how you get across your ideas when you're beta reading or CPing for someone while giving your criticism be, but being friendly and reasonable. So my top tip for this one is to ask questions. As you're reading, what questions do you have? Keep track of those. Then you give your questions to the person for whom you are beta reading or critique partnering. The thing is, most questions are pretty neutral in the sense that they're just like, huh, why is he thinking this? Or, hmm, why, why did it happen this way? Why did so-and-so do X, Y, Z? Usually there's not kind of loaded tone in a question of like, what the hell were you thinking? That's not a valid question, don't include that. And it's a way to approach legitimate questions you had about a book that essentially identify problems that a book has without being too frank with someone. Now there are a ton of different ways to give feedback, but that's kind of like my entry level tip when you're trying to figure out how to give more constructive feedback that is not necessarily going to upset someone. The other method is the compliment sandwich, where you start giving your feedback and you always start with the things that you really liked about something, what was working really, really well. Then in the middle, you give a couple of criticisms, some things that aren't quite working that you think the person needs to work on, and then you always end with the positive again. So those are my two methods for being friendly and reasonable and also logical. I try to always have a logic to the feedback that I'm giving, and that way the person that you're giving it to can take it a bit better. Kenzie Staley asks, what was the biggest surprise on the journey to having Brightly Burning published? That is a tough one, but I'm going to go with my cover reveal on Entertainment Weekly Dot com. Never in my wildest dreams would I have expected that, and the reason it was just so exciting for me. Um, my dream when I was 21 was to work for Entertainment Weekly. Like that was my literal dream job because I was a journalism major in college, and I even I interviewed for an internship there, and I oh, I made it to the final round, and I didn't get it. 
But therefore, it's so funny to me that this magazine that I grew up reading, that I idolized, that my cover reveal happened on their website, and it was a huge surprise. I wasn't expecting it at all. And honestly, it's just kind of the weird happenstance of the publishing industry. My publisher has a relationship with Entertainment Weekly, so they pitched it, and it happened. But it was a huge surprise, and it was really exciting. The next question is one I've gotten a lot, both on YouTube and on Instagram, from a lot of different people. So I'm just going to address it, and that is, is there going to be an audiobook of Brightly Burning? And the answer is yes, there is. Audible will be publishing my audiobook, and that is going to be coming out sometime in the fall. It's one of those beautiful publishing things where I don't actually know anything concrete, just that it's happening. So trust me, as soon as I have information on it and a release date and all of that jazz, I will definitely be telling you. I'm super excited for my audiobook because I have so many friends who exclusively listen to audiobooks. They don't like pick up physical copies of books and you know, I'd like them to read it. And I'm just also excited to like see who they choose as the narrator and all of that. So yes, an audiobook of Brightly Burning is coming soon. And so next, Jerry Cron asked me about sales, if I get them from my, my publisher. Um, so yes, I did ask my publisher how sales were going. I asked my agent to ask my publisher about those numbers about a month out from pub. I will admit I'm a little bit extra that I asked. You shouldn't necessarily ask, but I did because I do have access to book scan numbers. And so I had a friend looking them up for me and I wanted to know what my official sales number was for my publisher and it was higher than book scan so I did ask my publisher for that number but generally speaking you shouldn't be asking all the time I haven't asked since because I'm trying not to be neurotic about it but yes you can get your official sales number from your publisher and that's something that you can ask for via your agent or if you have a good relationship with your editor you can also ask your editor directly Next, Book Rose asked how I came up with the name of Hugo and Brightly Burning. And I honestly don't have a great answer other than I like fancy sounding boys' names. I like, like, if it sounds like a snobby British royal would be named that, I enjoy that name. So I like names like Henry and Hugo and Elliot and Theodore, like all of those super pretentious names. And so Hugo is just kind of a, I don't know, it sounded posh and it sounded, it sounded like a broody boy name. And so I picked Hugo. Um, but then, Ironically, as I was writing the book, um, I also read And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie for the first time, I am ashamed to say. And it turns out there's a pivotal character in that book named Hugo, and I had actually already decided that And Then There Were None would be Hugo's mother's favorite book. So the fates aligned and I was like, haha, I'm gonna say that's how Hugo got his name, you know, from his mom. So that, that was kind of fun, but honestly, it just sounded, it sounded like a, a nice, pretentious, pretty boy's name. So that's why I picked it. Next, Margaret the Word Nerd asked, how you edit when you feel like your brain is broken? Um, slowly or not at all. <laughs> um, seriously, but also not seriously. Um, when I really feel completely fried, which I did during my revision process, which you can hear all about if you watch some of my revision videos for my book too. Um, during those periods, I had to go really easy on myself, honestly. Um, my advice is to tackle the easier things when you're really feeling fried. Don't tackle the big things that are going to hurt you emotionally to work on. T take things in little baby steps, what you can handle on the day, and also some days don't edit. Sometimes you need a break because your brain is that fried. Um, and then, you know, exercise self-care, kind of my advice. So it's this weird kind of tango of managing what you can manage or not working when it's really bad and then taking the steps you need to take in terms of self-care, managing your stress and so on so that you can repair your poor fried brain so you can get back to work. That, that's kind of how I approached it when I, oh my brain was fried for a good two weeks there. I was just incapable of work and I, I, I did little things and then I, I took the self-care steps to get myself in a better position and then when the light switched back on and I got back into revision mode. Oh, it felt so good. It feels so good when everything's going well. So just kind of chug along through it and you'll go back to where you need to be. 
got a question from Ashley Bartell about how long a manuscript should be before you send it to a publisher or an agent. I do have an entire video on this. It's YA word counts, but the YA word counts can apply to word counts in other genres. So I'm going to link that down below. But generally speaking, your manuscript so technically it should be at least 50k, but realistically novels are longer than 50k. You need to shoot for 60, 70, 80k. It really depends on your genre, but I'd say the very safe sweet spot is 70k uh, for a novel. Um, that that it's, it's a hefty length, that's about 350 pages. So if you're looking for a benchmark to aim for, that's what I would look for. I writerly asked what my biggest challenges have been in creating my author to platform and what my recommendations are for overcoming those challenges. Um, the biggest challenge is definitely, oh, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of them. Um, and, and they're gonna shift and change. So at first, my biggest challenge was being comfortable in front of the camera. And my tip for that is just to record more. <laughs> the more you record and edit and kind of watch yourself and listen to yourself, the more comfortable you become. Um, so that was my first hurdle. And then my next hurdle was the frustration of lack of growth. Anytime you're a smaller channel and you're a newer channel, it is like rolling a boulder uphill, especially with the way that the YouTube algorithm works. And the unfair thing is, so the YouTube algorithm is going to reward consistency. You need to consistently be posting a lot of videos. They need to hit the sweet spot of time. You need to create videos that keep people engaged. Buzzy titles and keywords. There's all of these things, and I do have a video on growing your YouTube channel where I talk about a lot of these kind of algorithmic things. But you need to do those things while pushing through the frustration when they don't work because they're going to feel like they're not working until they do. You just have to keep at it. Um, and another, you know, tip as part of that is to engage with the community. So um, watch content on other people's channels, comment in their comments, like actively be a part of the author tube community and that helps you grow um, and you have to want to engage in the author tube community you shouldn't do it just to grow your own channel so it's it's kind of all that those things but probably the biggest hurdle was simply the frustration at lack of growth and it lasts for a while it it it's going to be slow until it's fast i didn't hit a thousand subscribers until february of this year and think about it, it's July and I have over 5,000 subscribers. That's like going from zero to 60. So it's a struggle until it's not a struggle and you just have to kind of push through. Next, Lindsay Puckett wants to know, what are a few YA books I wanna read before the end of the year? So I am so behind on reading. Uh, when I'm actively drafting and revising, it's really hard for me to read in my genre, so YA. Um, and so I just turned in my books. So the answer is all the books, um, but some specific titles. Uh, I really wanna read Sadie by Courtney Summers, and I did get an arc, and so I'm gonna read that. I love YA thrillers, and I've heard it's amazing. Um, I really want to read Furyborn, because I bought it, and I have it, and it is waiting for me. I still have to read it. Um, similarly, I still need to read this mortal coil. Um, finish this mortal coil. I read about a quarter of it because I want to finish it before the next one comes out in November because Emily Suvada is an amazing writer. Like, <laughs> that quarter I read kind of grabbed me by the navel and like yanked me. And I said this in a previous video, the only reason I didn't finish it is I had a copy, uh, like a PDF copy from Emily and I was reading it on my Kindle. And then the book came out and I was like, I'd rather read this in hardcover. So I have the hardcover and I just have to read it now that I've turned in my book. The other book that similarly I get to read now that I've turned in my book is Always Never Yours by Emily Wiberly and Austin Ziegeman Borka. I'm friends with Austin and Emily. I know them really, really well. They actually helped me get through my deadlines. They met up with me for a ton of writing dates. I don't just want to read their book because I know them. It is a high concept romantic comedy with a Shakespeare twist. I love stuff like that. I love high concept kind of, not fluffy, but kind of zingy romance. Like that's a genre of contemporary I actually read. I don't read a ton of contemporary. And I just cannot wait to read their book. I've heard nothing but raves and their next book coming out also sounds amazing. So I'm definitely looking forward to reading that one as well. Next, CB Planner wants to know what happens after book two, after I've turned in book two. Do I pitch new ideas to my agent? Like what happens? So 
my contract has an option in it. So that means that my publisher basically has the first right of refusal to see my next YA science fiction project. So what happens next? I kind of have already been having conversations with my agent about what I want to do for my option and it's something that I had already been working on before I sold Brightly Burning. So the next step, so technically you would talk to your agent about ideas that you would want to pitch for your option and then you work on a, an outline like a synopsis, a pitch, and sample chapters. So I already have sample chapters, I need to revise them um, and I would then I would need to work on the synopsis and then my agent and I would pitch it to my editor at HMH. So that's kind of how the process happens after you turn in your last contracted book. The timelines kind of vary, so I'm not going to be doing this until we're actually done with book two. I turn in my revision, but the book isn't done. There's still rounds of edits, especially line edits that have to happen, so the option usually happens after that because you want your editor to focus on one thing at a time. So that's kind of how it works. Right, Holly Davis wants to know about how kind of the balance between my day job and my writer routine has changed since my uh, my book deal, my book coming out. Um, it's definitely changed a lot in the sense that there's so much more that I have to do for writing, so many more obligations and deadlines to meet now that you know it's like it's real. So I've had to scale back on a lot of other stuff. I've had to stop doing other things in my life, hobbies and commitments and whatnot, because now I basically, my my priorities are day job, because bills and benefits, and the, my writer career. So I've really amped up the amount of writing I do, the amount of time I spend on promo, and that does include things like this YouTube channel kind of falls into the sphere of my author career. Um, I, I, I've probably upped the stuff, the time and, and commitment to my author life at least a quarter if not by 50%. So I, I've really kind of, you know, you have like day job and like other things, but you know, writing was here, very important, but didn't, you know, require quite as much of the bandwidth. And now it's like, it's up here. Like I really, and sometimes like my writing commitment is way up here. Um, cat. <laughs> Cats! Um, it was actually really dramatic. There was a fire alarm in my building last night, like really loud, really bad, and um, I had to get my cats into their carriers and we had to go outside. Like it was that dramatic. Like the alarm was not stopping. And my poor, my poor PETA, he's the one that you usually see the tail, um, really scared, really freaked out, did not want to get into his carrier. I felt really bad for him. Um, so th this is this is from poor PETA. Um, I don't blame him, but he really got me good. But everything was fine. Um, I, I'm not even sure if there was a fire in the building, but the alarm was, it went off for 30 or 40 minutes, so we had to leave the building. So very dramatic, but everything's fine. Shelby Deloya had a really great question about pen names versus real names and contracts. She asked what name I use to sign my contract always your legal name. So I sign everything contracty or legal with my real name, my legal name. Same thing with my copyright. My copyright is filed under my real name, my legal name. Um, so your, your pen name is for public facing things, but when you're signing any kind of documentation, you're going to be using your real name. So Jay writes one on Instagram asked what the word count and the page count was for Brightly Burning. So it was published at 391 pages and it was 94,500 words just to kind of give you a benchmark of like length. That's kind of long for a debut book. So but it gives you an idea. So 94.5K and 391 pages. Emily Rose, author on Instagram asked about book trailers and how that works, who makes them, who pays for them. So. 95% of the time, it's the author because book trailers are very optional. Most publishers don't want to do them, don't invest in them, and to be honest, they generally don't move the needle. So it isn't recommended that you do a book trailer, which is why publishers typically don't fund them. So if an author really wants one, it's on the author to take care of it. Um, and I'd say only do one if you do have resources available to you and you don't have to spend a ton of money. So for example, Adrienne Young had an amazing book trailer. 
Her husband works in film so he has skills and she had a wonderful friend who could dress up as Elin and they live in a beautiful mountainous area so it was a fun project that Adrian was able to do you know with people with some amazing skills and that totally made sense for her to DIY her trailer. There are other people who will hire someone like Gift Girl which can be a good idea as well working with someone whose specialty is to create book trailers. But generally to be honest I don't recommend it because most of the time they don't do anything or move the needle so it's really not necessary. Serena Sasha Books on Instagram asked me if I'm going to write anything that is not a YA sci-fi and the answer is yeah I really hope so. Um, so I'm a YA science fiction and fantasy girl. I kind of span those areas and I really 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 would like to publish um, like a YA historical fantasy like with magic like that's oh I love historical in general. Um, urban fantasy I've written one of those in the past so I definitely want to kind of get into the YA fantasy space. It's probably not going to be high fantasy. I really kind of like grounded fantasy something that's grounded in the sense of like urban fantasy or contemporary fantasy or historical fantasy. So um, definitely want to write one of those and uh, trust me if, if I have a fantasy coming out I will let you guys know. And being totally honest even though my book two is set in space I really nudged the needle as the meter as far over to fantasy as I could get away with. I put a lot of my favorite fantasy tropes in it. It's still sci-fi. It's still like re re grounded in that way. Um, but I have a lot of kind of fantasy-ish tropes including like royalty and that kind of stuff and dresses and balls. So I, I love a lot of the tropes that come with fantasy so I'm already kind of playing with them. The Reading Corner for All on Instagram asked if I have a motto to live by. Uh, this one kind of stumps me and I'm just gonna go like kind of off the top of my head and simple and say I'm gonna go with my motto being don't worry be happy like the old song. Um, I still worry a lot. I have anxiety so I definitely worry but I like the be happy part. I've always kind of focused on just being happy, being content. There's nothing better than just kind of being settled in yourself and happy where you are and taking pleasure from the simple things. That's something that's really important to me. You know, I consider myself to be a really happy person. I, I don't like to get too invested in the things I don't have. I like to focus on the things I do have and just be happy with something simple like getting to marathon a show I really like on Netflix or enjoying a yummy cupcake or a the beauty of a rainy day which oh, I miss so much when it rains in LA it is the best but um, yeah focusing on the things that make you happy that bring you joy and not focusing too much on what you don't have and being worried about things like that's that's something that's really important to me. And then I'll just end on a kind of fun one from beautifully bookish Bethany who asked me this on Instagram but she has a great YouTube channel which you can check out. Um, she asked me what my favorite makeup brands are. So these are just some of mine like they're not my favorite brands in the sense that I love every product from them but these are the brands that make products that I have spe you know specific things that are my ride or die products. So I love Fenty foundation. Um, I like Too Faced. I love my Sweet Peach palette. Um, Urban Decay concealer. Um, Bare Minerals matte liquid lipstick. Uh, I mean Lancome's just kind of you know ugh, a beautiful luxury brand when I can afford it. I love all of their products. Um, Clinique makes the Super Balms that I love. Um, Smashbox. I really really like the Smashbox uh, liquid uh, lipstick formula. Colourpop for amazing affordable things and eye makeup. I'm wearing Colourpop eyeshadow right now. Um, what else? Anastasia Beverly Hills. Um, I really really like their liquid lip glosses and you can't beat the modern renaissance eyeshadow palette. Oh I also have a couple of products I really really like from Stila as well. Great eyeliner and also the glitter. I have, I have their glitter product on right now as well. 
Oh, my favorite highlighter is from Makeup Forever. I like the high, you know, I, I select high quality products from them. Oh, and how could I forget Julep? So Julep is one of my favorite products. It's a little off the beaten path. They started as a nail polish company, a, like nail polish of the month, but then they started developing all these beauty products and it's all like K-beauty inspired. And I really like some of them. I love a lot of their lip products, especially. So Julep is one of my favorites. So that's it. Thank you for joining me for this Q&A. It's going a bit long, so I have to cut it off here. There were more wonderful questions I didn't get to, and I will try to do another Q&A and get to some of them then. Thank you so much for watching. If you do have further questions, you are welcome to drop them down below. I will come back to this thread to pull questions for the next time I film a Q&A. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. I can do more Q&As if you want. I'm always happy to answer questions. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, I post new videos two to three times a week all about writing, craft, publishing, YA, and books. Thank you so much for watching, and as always guys, happy writing!